Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone? It's so nice to be with all of you again. Um, today is an opportunity for you to ask me any fertility related questions. So I'm just going to do a live right now and it's an ask me anything about fertility. Um, what I ask of you is to put your questions in the question box below. So that circle with the question mark. Um, it just keeps me really organized in answering the questions. If you ask questions in the thread here, I'm not going to answer them. So ask me questions in the question box and I will answer them. So I see some of you are requesting to join me live. This is not a fertility hot seat. The next fertility hot seat is going to happen, I think, on Monday. That's a lie. Um, when's the next fertility hot seat? Did I just have one? No, I think the next fertility hot seat is happening on Monday. It's just not on my calendar for some reason. But let me just email my team about that. I'm pretty positive there's a hot seat on Monday. And then you guys can do that. But in the meantime, right now, what I'm here to do and support you with is questions about fertility. Okay, here come some questions. Um, and so those of you that are new to me, I know we're getting new uh followers all the time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Amy Raup and I have been in the space of helping women get and stay pregnant for two decades. I am an acupuncturist and herbalist, a practitioner of Chinese medicine by trade. I'm also an author of four books, two of them in the space of fertility. Um, I have a background in Western medicine, uh, biology, chemistry, neuroscience. I'm also studying functional medicine. I have um, education in nutrition, you know, kind of the gamut. So what I come at to help my clients with on their fertility journey is um, a very holistic approach, right? But I also have a very strong Western background knowledge. And of course, 20 years of clinical experience has given me a lot of knowledge in the space of fertility. And so, you know, we, we support, so I have a whole team of coaches now. We work with women all over the world. And we also have clinics in the tri-state area here in New York, Connecticut, and in, um, that's it, New York and Connecticut, New York City, Nyack, New York, Westport, Connecticut. Um, but we work nutritionally, physically, emotionally to really just, you know, help support your health because what what I always say and, and I firmly believe and I see this um, clinically is your fertility is an extension of your health and um, and I know the Western world really wants to um, of course support you and and help you get to baby as well and but I do feel like there's a lot of fear around um, age and and really we're not looking at the whole picture because it's not just age that's impacting fertility there's a lot of other things that that are at play here too and and there's also recent data showing you know not recent it's 20 years of data showing that we're maybe not actually running out of eggs um the way we've been taught and it seems like we're producing eggs these oogonio stem cells there's presence of those in human tissue uh, obviously female tissue um, there's even a lot of research, you know, I was just diving into some research too. I'm compiling, um, a research presentation on fertility and age, but I found two research papers, very recent ones that are showing that, um, even in, um, our forties that, you know, I think, I think we're always being told that all of our eggs are bad or only 5% of our eggs are good, even in our forties. But the research doesn't show that the research shows upwards of I'd say 40% of our eggs are actually still good, even in our 40s, even in menopause. I have two research papers right here open on my screen right now um, uh, that discuss that. One collected 21,000 UU sites and they tested them and they, that's just how they got this information. So these are human studies, human eggs. Um, so anyway, I, I do see it as part of my role is to help all of you, you know, to really empower you so you can ask the right questions and get the right support and the right care and not, um, you know, I'm not saying that you, you should wait forever to have children or that it's a guarantee that you'll have a baby even in your forties. I don't think anybody can promise that no matter what you're doing, but that, um, all hope is not lost. I think it's a good thing to have hope. If you don't think it's a good thing to have hope, then I'm probably not the person for you. 
Um, ways to support donor egg transfer. So that would be any way to support a regular transfer, right? Um, um, you know, I always, a big thing for me is making sure the uterine environment is ready to receive that embryo. So have you had a hysteroscopy? Have you had an endometrial biopsy? Have you ruled out endometritis, not endometriosis? I mean, endometriosis can play a role too in implantation, but endometritis, which is a uterine lining infection, which will not allow you to implant. I mean, I have a girl right now in the clinic who she's done two transfers with her own eggs, hasn't worked. She's now done three transfers with donor eggs, it hasn't worked. No one's done an endometrial biopsy on her. No one's looked deeper. Um, and that really is upsetting to me um, and frustrating. And obviously now she's five embryos down. Um, these are standard tests that should be done. Uh, you know, if you've had previous losses, you should have a miscarriage panel. You should make sure there's no clotting factor issues or a miscarriage. Um, issues that would impact your ability to stay pregnant. So those are the things that I would think about. I would do acupuncture before and after transfer, you know, really focus on, I say bone broth is like baby glue. You know, there's just, uh, I have recommendations even in my book, Yes, You Can Get Pregnant on keeping the child's palace warm, which is the uterus in Chinese medicine. So that's the stuff I would focus on. Um, can we hear even more about bone marrow PRP treatments available? Um, so I'm still learning myself, but I have had one patient who's done a bone marrow, um, stem cell PRP treatment, um, at a clinic in Spain. I believe it's IVI in Spain and, um, Alicante, I think is what it's called. IVI Alicante. And what they did, she's 28. She has premature ovarian failure. Her AMH was 0. 0.0001 or something like that. Um, she's menstruated like a few times in the last year, you know, after Chinese herbs and doing, you know, lots of dietary and things like that changes. But, um, she decided to pursue this trend, this treatment. They told her there's a 40% chance of restoring a uh, normal ovarian function in her and especially at her age. So they gave her um, a medicine like four days in a row that uh, causes her body. I think it's called Nupogen here in the U.S. It's called something else over the, in Spain. Um, it causes her body to produce more bone marrow, or recruit bone marrow stem cells into her bloodstream. They then drew blood four days in a row. And then I think they extracted and collected those bone marrow stem cells. And then they also did PRP, which is they you draw blood and you centrifuge it and you get the platelets. Um and the platelets are like gold and rich. So they mix the bone marrow with the PRP and then they inject it into the ovaries. Um, it's like a local anesthesia type of process. It is not a surgery. And and now we wait and see how it's working. Um, her AMH has gone up from 0.001 to 0.1, which is promising. Um, but we're only a few weeks out of the, of the treatment, I think five weeks. And so... Uh, I've also seen adipose stem cells where they do a little bit of liposuction and then take the stem cells from the fat and again, mix it with PRP, again, inject into the ovaries. I've seen that restore um, ovarian function um, in menopausal women. And that's being done here in the US. Those are all research studies right now, but that stuff is being done. Um, and outside of the US, it's being done like any of you could fly to Spain and it's $4,000 and you could do this. I mean, you obviously have to do a consult with this team, see if you're the right fit. Like I don't work for these companies, but I am seeing, I work with women all over the world. So we're seeing these types of things. PRP uh, about a year and a half ago was like, who does PRP? PRP doesn't work. Now ovarian PRP is like every clinic is doing it here in the U.S. because they're seeing it's helping. It's helping wake up the ovaries. It's helping produce more follicles. It's potentially helping with egg quality. So um, this stuff is happening. I just listened to a fascinating podcast on Monday. Mark Hyman had on, I actually just shared this in my private group. Um, I'm going to forget his Hariri, I think is his name, Dr. Hariri. And um, they were talking all about stem cells and the implications. And not just as, as it pertains to fertility, but as it pertains to any age-related disease. So this is going on. This is really happening. Um, the FDA in the U.S., as as the Dr. Hariri said, is, is risk-averse. And so it's not happening here in the U.S., but in other countries. Anyway, it's worth, you know, I think it's fascinating. Um, I don't know what the implications are and if it can promise you a baby in this second, but I think it's really interesting to see 
where technology is going and how things are changing. And then also, you know, looking at the data, which I did a complete research presentation for you guys. If you go to amyraup.com slash PNO for postnatal oogenesis, PNO. Um, and you can see that there is since 2004, there's over 80 research papers showing evidence that women, human women, are creating um, oogonio stem cells, meaning we are not just born with all the eggs we're born with and constantly running out of them. We're actually creating new ones. What that means, we're not quite sure. The implications of that, the stem cells are still um, exposed to the same aging process your regular eggs are exposed to, but some of them are talking about how they go dormant and can we wake them back up, that even in menopause, women still have a thousand eggs left. I mean, it's really fascinating information that is really gonna change, I think, our approach to fertility and kind of how we talk about, you know, you're, you're born with all the eggs you're ever born with. Um, I'm 43, I have one amazing embryo left after three failed FETs. What, can I go for a successful transfer? ERA was receptive, I'm taking on the vitamins and minerals. Um, so again, make sure you have been tested for endometritis and ruled out a uterine infection. There is a test called the Alice and Emma, but there's also just an endometrial biopsy you can do. Um, I would also get a hysteroscopy. It's your last embryo. I wanna make sure there's no scar tissue in that uterus. I wanna make sure the blood flow is where it should be. I would do acupuncture. I would do castor oil packs leading up to the transfer. Don't do them after the transfer. I have all the information on castor oil packs at amyrop.com slash castor oil. Um, and yeah, you know, I'll also prepare my girls for a month. If you have the time with some Chinese herbs in the lead up, I'll do regular acupuncture in the lead up and then pre and post transfer acupuncture. Um, bone broth, really warm cooked foods. Again, similar to what I said in the previous question of like really follow all of the tips on how to keep your child's palace warm, which I have in my book. Yes, you can get pregnant. Um, Hi, I'm stage 41, stage two endo, two failed IVFs, trying to start a new round in September on DHEA right now to prep. I have TSH at 3.1, any advice? So how much DHEA are you on? Do you need it? Has somebody tested your DHEA-S? That's what I would say first. If DHEA-S has been tested and it is low, it's fine to take DHEA. I would not do it at some of the recommended doses like the 25 milligrams three times a day. That seems to be too much and too high for a lot of women. Short term may be okay, but long term, no bueno. Um, and so I usually do 10 to 20 milligrams of DHEA if the patient needs it. Um, two failed IVFs, so I would, you know, I would wanna know more about that. Why, why did they fail? Was it retrieval? Did you get the blast? You know, um, what were the meds? Did you try lower stim? Endometriosis, you know, is an inflammatory, systemic inflammatory condition that affects the entire body. Are you following an anti-inflammatory diet? You know, the, the egg quality diet that I have, um, that book, it's my most recent book, really, you know, is, is geared towards uh, systemic inflammation and helping heal the gut and regulate the immune system. Endometriosis is also a lot of times comes with some immune system challenges. So like, has all that been looked at? That's kind of how I would look at it. There's autoimmune panels that can be done. There's miscarriage, clotting factor panels that can be done, um, a hysteroscopy, an endometrial biopsy, right? So like, we wanna check the uterine environment, make sure that that's checked. We wanna check the immune system and the systemic inflammation and make sure those things are in check. Um, and I cover a lot of this in detail in, um, in my books and then in other videos out there that you can go just Google, Google me or go on my YouTube channel. I have so many videos there. What to look for in a fertility acupuncturist? Had not so great experience. I wish I lived closer to you. Um, do you have any recs in other areas of people you know? We do have recs for other people. Um, if you email us, info at amyrop.com, I believe I have a list of acupuncturists that I believe are, you know, um, doing great work. I always say acupuncture is an art. Um, and so it really is about like jiving with the right person and feeling supported and heard. There are specifics, you know, I like to look for acupuncturists that are NCCA OM certified. Um, I really like acupuncturists that are herbalists as well because it just, um, there's an additional part to the medicine that, that comes with herbalism. So I, I, I 
I think I think that's a really important piece. Um, there's also acupuncturist. I am not Fayborm certified, but um, just because I just never had time to sit for the test. But um, there's a, a Fayborm certification, which then they're fertility acupuncturists. So it just means they understand this whole side of things, the Western side of thing. I think that's really great too. I would also ask for referrals, you know, in any of your Facebook groups, if you're in any groups for fertility challenges, just, and someone in your area, ask for a referral. I think that's another great way to do it. Um, I have 10 more minutes, guys, because then I have to go and do uh, pick up. Um, what are thoughts on taking HRT when trying to conceive? I have POI and intermittent cycles. Um, I have one successful natural pregnancy five years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, as long as you're being properly monitored, I mean, I have two POI girls that are cyclically, you know, doing estrogen and then progesterone to cause a bleed. And, and it does seem to like it's lowering FSH. It's kind of bringing on, um, I have one girl, she's ovulating with it. So sure, I think the big things is like that there's no other burden on the liver. That would be my biggest concern of like long-term use of HRT. And I do think there's there's um, great benefit in doing like bioidenticals if you can have work with a practitioner that does that for you. Um, but then also like why is the system shut down, you know, with the POI? Like have we looked at autoimmunity? Have we looked at ovarian antibodies? Are we working on inflammation in the body? So I kind of come at it from all sides with my clients. Um, but I, I think HRT can be really helpful. I just think about overall, like making sure you're non-toxic with your bath and beauty products, you're avoiding chemicals and, and, and pesticides and things like that in your food. You're as clean as you can be so that the liver only has to focus on these hormones and how to process them. Um, but I work closely with a lot of, uh, you know, we're a very integrative practice. And so we're working all the time with women undergoing fertility treatments. And so we're, you know, hormones are a big part of, of the piece of the puzzle and they can be very helpful for a lot of people, you know, um, any supplements specific to chemical pregnancies or resources? Um, yeah. So with chemicals, I think about two things, um, uterine environment, so again, has the uterus been checked? Is the environment hospitable to implantation? What's causing this pregnancy to come on, but then not stick? So I would, again, rule out endometritis, which is an underlying uh, uterine infection. I would also have um, a look inside the uterine cavity and make sure there's no polyps or fibroids or adeno or anything like that that's impacting the ability to get to, to stay pregnant. And then I would look at um, a clotting factor panel, a complete miscarriage panel, which if you go to amyrop.com slash miscarriage, you can download the PDF there of all the entire panel. Um, it could be a clotting factor disorder that's causing the um, early losses and maybe you need baby aspirin. Um, maybe you need a stronger blood thinner. Maybe you need to see a hematologist and get support that way. The other thing we see a lot of chemicals is um, with PCOS, and that's just because the eggs, um, there's so many trying to develop that they're maybe not getting as ripe as they need to be, and so they're just not as healthy as they could be. So if that is you, then I would really work on working on the PCOS. I would work on improving blood flow and circulation to the uterus and the ovaries. I love castor oil packs for that. I love Mayan massage. I love acupuncture. I love Chinese herbs, right? All of, all of the things. So hopefully that helps. Um, what are your thoughts on black cohosh for IUI FSH9? Um, I don't really have any thoughts. It's not how I use herbs. I'm an herbalist and um, we use herbs never singly, single, singularly, always um, in conjunction and based on a Chinese medicine diagnosis. So black cohosh can help some people with hormone levels, but um, not how I use. So I don't have a, a thought about it. I don't recommend that. Um, I would still come back to the basics and work on overall health and knowing that fertility is an extension of health. So, you know, looking at diet, looking at lifestyle, are you getting enough rest? You know, looking at hormone levels, what's your estrogen doing at ovulation? Is it hitting a peak? What's your LH doing? What's your progesterone doing in the luteal phase? That's another thing for the chemical pregnancies too. Um, has progesterone been checked in that luteal phase? Is it dropping off? That's another big thing. Uh, can you explain, explain how AMH can improve its supposed to show egg reserve? It's a little confusing. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that it's um, 
misleading. AMH can improve, FSH can improve, ovarian reserve can improve. How is that possible, right? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a great question to ask your doctor. Um, because AMH really, if you dig down into the data, seems to be a number that shows ovarian potential for that month. AMH can improve. AMH is secreted by the ovaries. So if you improve ovarian blood flow, ovarian health, if you get rid of inflammation that might be impacting the ovaries, maybe there's an endometrioma, maybe there's cysts, maybe there's endometri endometriosis, maybe I just had a girl with chronic appendicitis that was impacting her ovarian blood flow. Uh, maybe there's a GI issue going on. You improve ovarian blood flow, you will see AMH improve. AMH is secreted by the ovaries. So if you improve ovarian blood flow and function, you will see AMH improve. How is that possible if we're constantly running out of eggs and our reserves constantly going down? I'm being very facetious here. So I agree it's confusing because it doesn't match up. Um, I think we cannot set our sights on these numbers alone and let them define us because they cannot define us and they do not define us. These numbers change all the time. FSH changes in relation to estrogen. Um, AMH changes in relation from cycle to cycle and a response to ovarian blood flow. Um, I'm premenopausal. Is it possible to get pregnant naturally? I'm 44, FSH 5.5, estrogen 11, 24. That estrogen is super high. Um, I would want to know why your estrogen is really high, and I would work on detoxifying your estrogen. Um, drink my liver support soup from the egg quality diet every day. Take broccoli sprouts every day. Why is your estrogen high? You might have fibroids. You might have a thick lining. You might have polyps. I would have a hysteroscopy and make sure. Um, an FSH of 5.5 is not premenopausal, so love you, but no, just because you're 44 doesn't mean you have to label yourself as premenopausal. We're all premenopausal the second we start menstruating, by the way. You know, we just kind of head in that direction, right? It's a spectrum. Um, FSH of 5.5 is super low. So you also always want to look at antral follicle count. That's how many eggs are in the ovaries. Upon count, upon scan, you want to look at AMH, you want to look at estrogen, you want to look at FSH. Um, if you're ovulating and menstruating, there's always a possibility to get pregnant. I know some people would say at 44, you have a 5% chance each month of getting pregnant. And that is in comparison to women who have a 25% chance when they are 25 years old. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, but also keep in mind some of the current research, which um, I will just quote this one study. It's meiosis errors in over 20,000 oocytes studied. Um, and this actually came out in 2011 when they were looking at PGD testing, 2010. Um, but what they found was that women in your age group, um, call it 44, um, that about 55 to the upper limit, 60% of the eggs are abnormal, but 40% of them are actually normal. There you have it. Um, and that's just one research study. There's lots um, what are your thoughts on St. John's bush tea? I don't have any thoughts on that because I don't know what it is. I'm sorry. I have two more minutes. Um, I had a miscarriage in April 23 and a thyroid panel done after TSH came back normal at 1.1 free T4, 1.37 TPO was 28, TG at 68. Could this indicate autoimmune issues? Um, would equal, equally diet help with this? Yes and yes. Um, whenever uh, thyroid antibodies are really above like a 10 or a 20, it's showing some autoimmune activity. So sure. And then I wouldn't just look at like those numbers. Like how do you feel? What's your health doing? Do you have signs and symptoms of inflammation or gut dysbiosis or, you know, just not feeling great energy all the time? Like, you know, how is your overall health? And that's what I would work on and, and, and also knowing you can get pregnant, that's a great sign. I mean, miscarriages suck. I, I know them first firsthand. I know how bad it sucks. Um, and obviously secondhand in my clinical work, I know how bad it sucks. And so I'm not saying that in a way of like, oh, just, you know, it's a good sign that you got pregnant. I didn't mean it like that, but it is a good sign. Um, so something's trying to work. So I would work on inflammation in the body and the egg quality diet. That's exactly what it's geared towards. Yes. Um, baby aspirin safe long term stomach lining not necessarily safe long term I mean the goal is that we're not taking it super long term but I only ever recommend it in the luteal phase after you ovulate once you could be pregnant you would then stop it once you got your period and then you would start it again the next time after you ovulate if you do get pregnant while you're on it usually you stay on it through the first trimester 
Um, I also think that, you know, in this whole grand scheme of things, if you're living a really clean lifestyle and the baby aspirin is one of the few things you're doing that's not, you know, supremely awesome for your system, I do think the pros outweigh the cons. That's how I look at it. Baby aspirin has helped so many of my girls um, hold pregnancies where they couldn't otherwise. So I'm a, I'm a fan. Um, any advice to increase lining? Okay, this can be the last one I answer because I have to leave. I'm sorry. Um, increased lining, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, castor oil packs, mine abdominal massage, pelvic floor PT, uh, nettle tea with blackstrap molasses, organic nettle tea with one tablespoon of organic unsulfured blackstrap molasses every single day, Ch Chinese herbs, did I say that? Eating a nutrient dense diet, lots of protein, lots of fat, lots of like things that boost blood. Liver is a great organ meat that boosts blood. Red meat, grass-fed red meat, beets, um, green vegetables, uh, bone broth. Those are all really good things for helping thicken the lining, okay? So with that, I'm gonna go. I love you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. I'll see you very soon. Thank you.